and I think we're good to go. Let's go ahead and lock that in. Place your order. What's going on everyone? So this video and the next few will be a bit out of the ordinary for me. I've made some music focused videos on this channel before, but never really strayed from that. But I've always been really into tech ever since I was a kid, and I think I finally found the perfect opportunity to talk about these two passions together. So as a professional music producer and independent artist, making music is obviously my foremost priority, but right alongside that is content creation. So visual effects, video editing, like what you're watching right now, graphic design, file management, productivity, live streaming, and for the past 15 years, I've been using Windows PCs to serve that purpose. But with Apple's latest Mac lineup, I think it's time to change that. For those who don't know, Apple recently unveiled their fourth generation Apple Silicon chips, the M4 family, in a variety of new Macs. You got the iMac, MacBook Pros, and of course, the redesigned Mac Mini. Now, as soon as this thing was unveiled, I knew I wanted one. The design, the IO, the engineering, the performance, it feels like this is easily one of the best solutions for mid-level professionals like myself. Now, I know there's also the Mac Studio and the Mac Pro, but those won't get updated until next year, and they also come at ridiculously high prices, so definitely intended for those with heftier budgets. So with that out of the way, let's talk about this new Mac Mini and the switch from PC to Mac. Now, I know I'm not the first or only one to make this switch. There are already some great videos out there on the topic, and I'll link some of them in the description below. But I do think I have some unique insight to share for anyone else interested in making the jump or wanting to learn more about the new M4 Mac Mini. So let's break this video into three sections and we'll go through them one by one. So number one, music production is a niche workflow. It can sometimes be hard to find really in-depth resources for specific tech issues that music producers face. And like I said, I've always been a huge nerd about both music and tech, and I've been through 15 years of pretty consistent tech support on that front, so I know what makes things tick in the music production world. Number two, I've been a cross-platform user for my entire adult life, so I've actually used both a Mac and a PC every single day for, again, pretty much the past 15 years. And my current machines are a custom small form factor Windows PC and a 2021 M1 Pro MacBook Pro, and the PC serves as my main workstation and for gaming, while my Mac is mainly for productivity and occasionally on-the-go production. So I know what it means to ditch Windows for Mac OS, and and boy, do I have a lot of reasons to do so, but more on that later. Number three, cloud storage. So I actually first opened my measly two gigabyte Dropbox account back in 2010, and I still use that very same account to this day, although now it's two terabytes instead. Back in the day, I was backing up all my projects and samples at a time when Skrillex had just permanently lost his entire debut album on a hard drive. So yeah, that was pretty painful to see. And it wasn't just Skrillex. I mean, to this day, far too many of my music producer friends still post about losing data or devices and having to start projects completely from scratch. So what does all of this have to do with buying a new computer? Well, let me walk you through some of my purchasing criteria and how these things affect my configuration choices. Let's start with number one, the music production aspect. One of the most discussed aspects of any new Mac review is video and photo editing. Now, these can definitely be a great way to gauge overall performance between machines, but when it comes to audio production with tens or hundreds of tracks and dozens of software instruments and effects, CPU and RAM are absolutely essential. Now, for context, my current PC is a custom small form factor build running an 8-core Ryzen 3700X CPU with 32 gigabytes of DDR4 RAM and an RTX 3060 Ti GPU. Now, with some large orchestral arrangements and intensive synth parts, underrun start to creep in and make real-time work in my DAW nearly impossible without distracting and painful audio glitches. And most music producers would probably just say, oh, just freeze your tracks and you'll save some CPU usage. And they're partially right. Freezing tracks to audio instead of real-time engine playback can save some resources, but having the plugin loaded at all in the project uses resources of its own that you can't really save. And for me personally, being able to edit note and effects data on the fly is an absolute imperative at nearly every stage of my creative workflow from beginning to end. So more CPU and RAM it is. Now, I've heard great things about the base 10-core M4 chip, and at 599, it's no doubt an impressive machine. I literally laughed out loud. I saw this YouTube video of someone who launched every single app from cold boot with absolutely no delay. It's just ridiculous how fast it was. And yet it's pretty important to consider core type in that equation as well. So with Apple Silicon, you get some number of performance or P cores, and you get some number of efficiency or E cores. Now they're mostly self-explanatory. The P cores specialize in handling intense workloads and the E cores specialize in running sort of low priority, low energy tasks, like just maintaining the operating system. So the base model M4 has just four performance cores with six efficiency cores. And for audio production, what this means is that realistically, you only really have four cores doing the heavy lifting for this time sensitive workload, like real time audio processing. Clearly this would be a step backwards from having an eight core Ryzen CPU, which is primarily why I chose to look instead at the 
the maxed out 14 core M4 Pro chip. Now this one flips the balance and gives you 10 performance cores with four efficiency cores, as well as a slight clock speed bump across the board according to Geekbench results. To explain why this is so monumentally important, let me tell you a story about my recent trip to the Apple Store. So here we are at the Apple Store, I'm recording a voiceover after the fact, and we're checking out Logic Pro on the new base M4 Mac Mini with 10 cores, so that's 4 performance cores, and you'll see Logic is showing us those 4 cores on the CPU meter here. Now this is a demo project for Montero by Lil Nas X, and we're going to go ahead and see how long it takes to bounce this whole song. So we'll start the timer, and right away you can check out those CPU cores at 100% utilization, they're going full bore, and you can see this is a pretty hefty project too. Uh, 140 tracks and plenty of plugins, so it's definitely working hard on this one. Now, what this shows is that in DAWs like Logic, uh, this sort of offline audio rendering where it's kind of zipping through as fast as possible, it'll use all the resources that are available to it, and the more cores, the faster those cores, uh, the quicker this usually takes. So we'll let this finish up and see how long it takes. So it took a little less than 60 seconds, and again, this is a base M4 Mac Mini with those four performance cores, and you know, not a bad result by any means given the complexity of the project, but now let's go compare it to the M4 Pro. Now they don't have the M4 Pro Mac Mini on display, but instead we're just going to do this test on the 12 core M4 Pro MacBook Pro with eight performance cores, and it's not exactly apples to apples because it's in a different form factor with different cooling and different display and all of that, but I just want to show this. So same exact project, same bounce settings. And let's start and look at that. There's our eight cores lighting up. So exactly double the core count for pro audio use. And you'll see just how wild of a performance uplift this one simple upgrade can be. And as you can see, those eight performance cores in the M4 Pro took just about 30 seconds, which is literally a 2x improvement in render time compared to the base M4 chip with its four performance cores. So a pretty obvious one-to-one -one difference there that translates directly to save time, increased productivity, and ultimately that's more money back in your pocket if you're doing this kind of thing day in, day out for clients or customers or what have you. So I hope that explained a bit why CPU is so, so, so important, not only when it comes to real-time work, but also intensive render jobs, which absolutely comes into play when you're batch exporting full-length stems regularly. And this is not some theoretical or rare benchmark use case, at least for me. And that's why I ultimately decided to go with the upgraded 10p core M4 Pro chip. Now, as for RAM, this primarily comes into play when you're working with a large number of samples and sampler instruments. So this includes basic audio channels like one shots, loops, and stems, but also these massive multi-gigabyte library instruments being loaded into fast memory for things like contact, orchestral plugins from Spitfire Audio, things like that. Now, basic soft synths like Serum or Silent One, which are two of my favorites, they might not use that much RAM, but an orchestral project would absolutely start to add up. And one other thing to consider with Apple Silicon Chips is that basically the whole thing sits on a single die right alongside the RAM packages. And what this means is that it's shared system-wide between the CPU and the GPU cores. So my PC, for example, has 32 gigabytes of DDR4 RAM, but also my 3060 Ti GPU has eight gigabytes of VRAM. So when you combine that, it's a comparable sort of total of 40 gigabytes. So that's why I'm going with the 48 gigabytes on the Mac mini, because downgrading from 40 to 24 would not really be suitable. And so I had to go with the next closest option. All right, with that out of the way, let's move on to number two, and that's the cross-platform experience. Look, I like Windows. I feel comfortable in Windows at this point, and there are situations where I honestly actually prefer it over Mac OS. But as a professional nearing my 30s, my first priority now is just having an OS that, for lack of a better phrase, it just works. And I can definitely say that Mac OS does that better at this point. If you want to trim a video just like you would on your phone, just launch QuickTime Player, trim it, you're done. <laughs> If you want to quickly preview a file, hit spacebar, you got quick look in Finder, done. If you want to change system keyboard shortcuts and create custom macros on a per app basis, you don't need to download auto hotkey or third party tools, it's literally built right into the system settings. And these are all technically possible in Windows with these additional third party tools, but that kind of defeats the point, right? The OS itself is better. And the fewer the random apps I have installed, the more efficient I can use my storage and the precious CPU cycles. Now, to be clear, this video is not an OS war. This really isn't supposed to be anti-Windows or pro Mac, but one more point I do want to make on this topic while we're on it, and it's absolutely imperative for music production. I got two words, USB devices. Anyone with a handful of synths and a passing interest in content creation can attest to how many damn USB devices are involved. Now here's a complete list of all of my current USB devices. We got webcams, we got MIDI keyboards, we got an audio interface, 
iLock dongle for authorizing plugins, an Elgato Stream Deck, even a USB-C HDMI capture card for my Nintendo Switch. And I can hardly even begin to explain just how many hours have been spent troubleshooting bizarre USB device recognition issues on Windows, whether it's my webcams not being recognized, whether it's my audio interface dropping out randomly and requiring a power cycle. Not so fun fact, I've actually had to restart my audio interface a couple times while editing this video just because it kept glitching out and crackling. And don't even get me started on the nightmare that is the Korg USB MIDI driver on Windows. I swear I will rant about that for 10 minutes. Sorry, I'm getting mad just thinking about it. Now, when I plugged the same USB hub into my MacBook Pro to test it, everything literally just worked right out of the box. And I'm not the only one who has noticed this. Device support on Windows can just be brutal sometimes. And on macOS, it's honestly not even a consideration. And now on to my last point, cloud storage. So I actually take a pretty interesting approach to using cloud storage. I basically keep everything on there, all of my project files, my entire sample library, which is like over 100,000 files, totaling over 80 gigs, all of my creative files and After Effects, Premiere, Photoshop, basically my whole organizational structure is on Dropbox. But one of the nice things about this is that I can have a combination of local access when I need it and archival offloading when I need to save some space. So right now my PC is using about 360 gigabytes for my local or offline Dropbox files, but I'm actually using one and a half terabytes on the Dropbox account itself. And there's a great way to manage this within the Dropbox app. You can drill down and find your biggest storage sinks and immediately free up that space without losing any data. So when it came to configuring the outrageously priced storage upgrades on the Mac mini, I figured I could go with a lower tier than I might otherwise need thanks to that cloud storage and just reuse the two terabyte NVMe drive from my PC by popping it into a Thunderbolt 4 enclosure for pretty fast data speeds. All right, so I wanted to do a little addendum slash rant here while we're on the topic. So check out the description for a second video where I give some hot takes on Apple's upgrade prices. But in short, please refer to this very professional Microsoft Paint graph. Okay, now moving on. So let's go ahead and build my next music production workstation. So we're here on the product page for the Mac mini and I'm doing this on my Windows PC, which is a little bit sacrilegious, but that's just how it goes. So let's go ahead and buy and we're gonna take a look here at the M4 Pro chip. So let's go ahead and select that with the M4 Pro. Uh, as I mentioned, the first thing we're gonna be doing is upgrading that chip to get two extra CPU cores and four extra GPU cores. This will help with multi-core uh, rendering and, and things of that nature, as well as just graphics performance. Make it a little bit more comparable to my PC in terms of the 3060 Ti and uh, gaming and all that. And as for the unified memory, let's go ahead and select that 48 gigabytes of unified memory. Like I mentioned, this is basically on par with what I have in my current machine. We have 32 gigs of DDR4 RAM in my PC and that combined with the eight gigabytes on the 3060 Ti, you compare that to 48 gigabytes of unified memory, which is shared between the system and the graphics uh, side of the chip, the GPU. So 48 gigabytes for the system. Uh, it's just a little bit of an upgrade from what I have right now, which is basically 40 gigabytes. And as for the storage, so we're looking at, uh, the, it comes with the 512 gigabyte SSD. I'm going to be upgrading this to the one terabyte. I know this price is not great, but I am keeping in mind that I'm going to be able to use my NVMe from my PC, as well as some other drives that I have sitting around and basically Thunderbolt that into the Mac mini and get up to, I think 3151 megabytes per second using um, there's an OWC product called the Express 1M2 that I'm going to be sliding that into uses Thunderbolt 4 you get some pretty great speeds out of that so not too concerned about storage I'm just going to do one terabyte uh, that should keep me set for the boot drive and then this last option the Ethernet so I actually think this is a really reasonable price for 10 gigabit Ethernet uh, 90 bucks with the education discount now gigabit Ethernet is great and unless you have over gigabit actual internet through your ISP there won't really be a difference in terms of whether you have gigabit, two and a half gig, five gig, 10 gig. Where it does matter is if you have local networking and local storage. So for example, I have a NAS drive that allows me to basically share files, backup, do all sorts of things. And this will be tremendously useful and beneficial for connecting to that if I have 10 gigabit ethernet versus just gigabit. You look at uh, PCI cards, PCIe cards for PCs to add 10 gigabit ethernet is often more than $90. So I consider this actually one of the better deals in terms of the upgrade path for the Mac mini. So we're going to go ahead and select that as well. And as you can see, our total now is going to be redacted. And why don't we just go ahead and uh, continue with the purchase? It's going to ask if you want to add a studio display. Uh, if you want to add any other accessories, we're going to say no. I've already got my own. And let's add to bag. Okay. And here we are with the product page. Let's just confirm this is correct. 14 core CPU, 20 core GPU, 
and 48 gigs of unified memory, one terabyte SSD storage, 10 gigabit ethernet, and I think that's all. Place your order. All right, and we're all set, and the Mac Mini is on the way. Once this thing arrives in the mail, I'll be making a lot more content with it. I wanna show you guys what the complete music producer setup process is like, especially file migration from a Windows PC and we'll do some testing to see how it fares against the PC it's replacing. And I wanna hear from those of you who are interested in more tech-focused music content like this, so let me know what you think down below in the comments. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe. Peace.